This video is an introduction to the homework for Chapter 6 for Statistics. In the previous chapter, we had curves associated with the binomial distribution. That was a discrete, those were discrete values. Here we're going to have a similar curves, but they're going to be for continuous values. So down here on the x-axis, we have continuous values. Whoops. Let me get the marker here. These are continuous values. In this case, we're showing them from 20 up to 180. Right. On the vertical axis is the probability density. That means the probability is not given directly. Instead, the density of the probability is given. The actual probability is the area under these curves, or under certain sections of these curves. So that's the first thing that we have to get understood. The um, you're used to seeing frequency or probability over here on the vertical scale. And now you're seeing probability density. The values are continuous. Okay, These curves are going to be called either normal, Gaussian, or bell-shaped curves. And they're very symmetric. They're symmetric about a line through the center. I've shown three here. All of them have a mean of 100. The mean is right here in the middle of the bell-shaped curve. The mode and the median are also there too. But we just mainly work with the mean for the calculations. So the mean is right here in the middle of the curve. What I'm showing here is what the standard deviation does to it. And you have a feeling for this from previous chapters. Here the standard deviation is 10. As the standard deviation increases, notice the peak drops, but the curve kind of smushes out. And here a standard deviation of 30. Here's a uh, comparison between your um, discrete probability distribution and continuous bell-shaped or normal probability distribution. So the endpoints of these curves, this would be discrete, of course, values. You could sort of draw a line through them and see that it looks like the normal distribution. Now, there are two big differences between your discrete distribution, your binomial distribution, and the normal, and I guess I always put together the Gaussian or bell-shaped distribution. And the first is that for this binomial distribution and the discrete distribution of chapter 5, the, the independent variable, the random variable, variable was discrete. So you're looking for the number of times that um, heads turned up when you flipped a coin, or the number of games won. It's discrete. In this chapter, the independent variable is continuous. And continuous variables are things like weight, height, blood pressure, income, or temperature, something that's measured. The second big difference uh, I pointed out before in the graph uh, on a previous slide, the, for chapter 5, the vertical axis gave the probability, the actual probability of the event happening. And the event could be described exactly as that particular number. When you have um, the normal distribution of this chapter, the vertical axis is the probability density. And here's some words, written words, for what I just said. The vertical axis for this chapter gives the probability density. It does not give the probability directly. This means you can't use a bell-shaped curve to find the probability directly. Uh, in fact, the bell-shaped curve is not used to find the probability of a single value anyway. It's used to find the probability that the measured value will lie between two numbers, or less than a given number, or greater than a given number. And the probability itself is the area between the curve and the x-axis. Finding that curve analytically is impossible, even in calculus. So it's done with tables, it's done with approximations, and we're going to use tables in this case. And this is a graph showing what I meant. This is a normal distribution, your bell-shaped distribution. Here are the continuous values. Say these are I don't know, IQ values. All right. It looks like the mean is 100. It's right in the center of the curve. Now, if you want to know the probability of someone having an, an IQ between 100 and 101, that would be the area under this curve. What's shaded right here. Well, I went outside of it with that, but 
well this is from the written lecture notes for normal distributions or Gaussian or bell-shaped distributions the probabilities are calculated for an interval such as the interval between 100 and 101 they are not calculated for discrete values such as 100 or 101 by themselves the probability is not given by the vertical scale instead it is the area under the particular bell-shaped curve to find these areas, these probabilities, some computers will do it for you. Um, or you can use table E and appendix C, or that same table is reprinted in the front cover of the textbook. It's interesting that there is a formula, actually a fairly simple formula, for calculating all of those bell-shaped curves. And all you need to use this formula is the mean and standard deviation. And this is the formula. There's an exponential e, uh, and the exponent of it is minus x, the value you're, you're, um, you're tracing out on the x-axis, minus the mean squared, divided by 2 times the standard deviation squared. Then it's divided by the standard deviation times the square root of 2 pi. If you calculate all those values of x, you will trace for, you know, for, uh, you know, maybe from two or three standard deviations below the mean to three above the mean, you'll trace out your bell-shaped curve. That will be your y values. Of course, the main interest isn't that curve itself, it's the area beneath the curve. Certain areas are well known. They're well known from this from these curves that when you saw them in chapter three. Okay. There's certain areas um, about the mean, plus or minus one standard deviation the area under that curve is 34.3 well 0.3413 or 34.13 percent and that's written sigma plus mu I mean mu plus sigma and mu minus sigma mu is mean sigma is standard deviation and here's this curve and you need to know it for the test so here's the mean right in the middle okay if you add one standard deviation to the mean and you subtract one standard deviation from the mean, that between those two values, here to here, that area under that curve is 68 percent. That'd be all this. Each one is 34, um, 34 percent. Between the mean minus the standard deviation and minus two standard deviations, the area under the curve right here is 13.6 percent and similarly is 13.6 percent from the mean plus the standard deviation to the mean plus two standard deviations. If you want to go between two and three standard deviations the area under the curve is 0.02 percent. So here's an example of how to use it. Say you knew that blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, followed a bell-shaped curve and that the mean was 120 and the standard deviation was 10. If you want to know the probability that a systolic blood pressure was between 120, which is the mean, and 130, so this is mu, and this is mu plus sigma, well you already know that area is 34 percent, and so that's all you need to know for that because those areas are already known. The real problem, of course, is when you're trying to use some region of the curve, like, for example, from here to here, and then you have to use uh, the tables. But for these cases, if you're just working with the mean plus or minus certain number of standard deviations, you can just use the results that are well known for those particular areas. Here's the same curve, mean of 120, standard deviation of 10, but now if you want to know the probability of the blood pressure line between 130 and 140, again this is uh, mean plus a standard deviation, mean plus two standard deviations. Since you've picked out an area that's well known, uh, you can just quote the result. It's 13.6 percent, approximately. If you go over several of those well-known areas, you just add them up. In this case, you wanted to know what the standard, um, what the blood pressure was for, this would be mean, whoops, this is the mean minus two sigma to the mean plus two sigma. You know, this area is 13.6, here's a 34, 34, 13.6, you just add them all up and they turn out to be 90, about 95%. 
There's a few other properties for the bell-shaped curve. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the mean is right in the middle of the curve, but so is the median and the mode. They're all in the same place. If the bell-shaped curve is skewed to one side or the other, then the mean follows the area that it's skewed towards, but um, the median the median and the mode stays about the same. But for a regular bell-shaped curve that's symmetric about the center, the mean, median, and mode are all the same. Of course, I mentioned here that this true this bell-shaped curve, this normal distribution is symmetric about the mean. The area under the tire curve is one, and that makes sense. This was a probability density, and the actual probability is the area under the curve. Then, and probabilities have to add to one. Then the area under the curve has to equal one. But the um, actual calculation is beyond this class. So that's sort of an introduction. There's another video where I'll introduce the z-scores and using the standard normal di distribution. The important point is that with this bell-shaped curve, you're talking about continuous variables. That's something that's measured. The probability is the area under the curve. It's not the vertical scale. The vertical scale is a probability density. You have to find the area under the curve.